Actually, this is something we started to do uh, a few years ago um, when I was in, in Padua with uh, the group of uh, Cesare Montecucco. Um, and the, the, the whole idea uh, originated from the study of uh, botulinum neurotoxin, not by myself, but, but by the group of, uh, of uh, Cesare. And uh, in my case, the, the, my, my collaboration was try to put some structures in uh, the, the process of fusions of membranes in neuroxocytosis. Uh, I know that uh, you're, you are not um, very familiar with this, with this field, so you're not experts. I know very well, more or less, the, the groups here. Um, <clears throat> let me just tell you uh, very briefly why, and why we are working with this and why I'm going to present you. This is my group. These are the, the, the present members, and these are some of the forum members uh, in Montevideo. Uh, we belong to a, a network of institutes uh, all around uh, the world. It's like uh, 32 or 33 uh, Pasteur Institutes. And um, of course, along the presentation, you can interrupt me whenever you want, and I will anticipate one of your questions, which usually is uh, anyway where is uh, uh, Uruguay or, or Montevideo. Uh, so we are a, a small country uh, in, in down in South America between Brazil and Argentina. And actually, what we are doing, or what uh, we are actually putting a lot of effort, is in constructing something which will be critical for you, uh, which is a set of simplified representations for molecules that allow to accelerate simulations. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to speak about these things here. Uh, just if you are curious, go to this web page and you will find uh, publications and, and some insights on, on what we are doing. Um, so for the rest, uh, of the of the seminar, um, I would like to tell you some of the things we are uh, doing with these tools. So essentially, we are trying to do and to use some tools coming from bioinformatics uh, and modeling and simulation techniques. And uh, one of those is applied to uh, to the synaptic vesicle fusion in neuroexocytosis. This is a picture that you, for sure you may have seen uh, already. Uh, it's um, taken from the internet. I don't know uh, exactly where. This, this is uh, uh, the, the site, I guess. Um, but in usually, I think this is something that you should uh, already have seen from the textbooks. And all the process <coughs> of uh, uh, vesicle fusion, and which finally ends in neurotransmitter release, uh, is something which is very well studied. And as a physicist, uh, I like it very much because it is something which, is, which can be uh, confined to a very uh, reduced number of, of, uh, of uh, participants. Uh, so you can simplify the entire thing and try to go. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I, I got a, a bug in the plane, so I'm not in my base shape. Um, so I was saying you can simplify some of the things and try to focus in the, in the membrane fusion just with a very few participants. In particular, these are, these are just a, a few proteins. And this was actually my idea when I started this back in uh, 2005. And then I was uh, progressively discovering that the situation was not that easy as I, as I imagined at the beginning. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something of the things that we, we discover along the process. Um, if you don't remember very well, uh, let me just remind you uh, that um, which are the, these uh, this, uh, constitution, uh, constituents of um, the, the fusion machinery. Uh, they are called snare proteins. Uh, if you don't remember, they, these are uh, proteins that work as a molecular velcro. So they have uh, essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a trimeric complex uh, as depicted here. This is uh, from a, a Nixray structure. Uh, it's a four helix bundle. There is one protein called uh, SNAP25, which is uh, here in green, and two other proteins uh, called uh, syntaxin in red and uh, VAMP or uh, synaptobrevin in blue. Uh, this protein recognizes themselves. Uh, VAMP stands for vesicle associated membrane. VAMP stands in the, in the vesicle and lives in the, in the vesicle and is um, recruited to the plasma membrane. <coughs> and somehow, when these uh, three proteins find together in the same place, they recognize and form immediately uh, this complex. Uh, this part here, which is extended, corresponds to transmembrane uh, regions 
of the, of the two uh, proteins, and these are the anchors that serve to uh, keep the proteins within the membrane. Okay, I think this, you should be more or less familiar with that. Uh, something which is quite interesting is that uh, the, this is the, 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 the formation of this complex is uh, uh, quite uh, exogenous. Uh, uh, it, it releases energy, uh, and so um, actually you release or you gain energy in the formation of this complex uh, in an amount which is nearly uh, 10 kcal per mole. So you really gain a lot of energy doing that. And uh, by doing this, these proteins pull two membranes together, if, um, pushing them uh, close enough to uh, ensure the membrane fusion. Okay? Uh, the, this kind of uh, snare proteins are very common and, and they mediate a lot of membrane fusions. Uh, actually, we are, I mean, and this is the, 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 the common picture. Um, this is a schematics, and this is just an N terminal in, in, in syntaxing, which is. Uh, used for, for regulation. Uh, in the common view, it is the formation of this complex is enough, and what happens is that you fuse the plasma membrane with the vesicle membrane by the formation of the complex with these two proteins anchored there. Okay? However, the things in neuroexocytosis and neuroexocytosis are a little bit more complicated. There are uh, many other proteins involved. Uh, minimally, the, there is a protein called uh, complexin. This protein binds also to the snare, uh, to the snare complex uh, in an anti-parallel fashion. Uh, there is a, 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 uh, another protein called synaptotagmin, which is actually a calcium sensor. It contains uh, calcium binding sites, which uh, allow to sense the presence of calcium. And there are some other proteins from the family of the family called Munk, uh, which is uh, which are uh, essentially uh, related to the to the regulation of these processes. Uh, for what I am concerned, we are going to be speaking about the first uh, five proteins and in, and their uh, their interaction, because things get already quite complicated with that. Um, the interest in in the study of these proteins. Uh, started with, at least for, for myself, um, and also for my collaborators, uh, started with, the, with the, the problem of uh, the action of the botulinum neurotoxins. Botulinum neurotoxins, there are um, uh, seven serotypes, but essentially they all share uh, the same functioning. Uh, the, the, the intoxication is depicted in these four uh, basic steps. Uh, the first one is the membrane binding, so there is a toxin which is attached to the membrane using uh, specific recognition patterns, among them a gangliocyte. Uh, then there is an internalization process, uh, and eventually this, uh, this toxin um, can uh, reach maturation, uh, also mediated by differences in, um, in pH. And once the maturation is reached, and the, the toxins are translocated uh, to the cytoplasm, then this, um, the catalytic part of uh, this enzyme can cleave different snare uh, proteins at different places. Uh, this, I mean, the cleavage of these snare proteins uh, hampers the formation of the complex between the, the membrane, the, um, the vesicle membrane, and the, the plasma membrane, um, interrupting the communication and the neurotoxicity release. And this eventually leads to the blockage of the neuromuscular junctions. And this is why, uh, essentially, uh, these toxins are, are, are so um, dangerous, because they really uh, block all the, neuro the neuromuscular and muscular junction with uh, an extremely high uh, um, uh, selectivity. Uh, so that, essentially, when you get uh, botulism, uh, what happens is that your muscles just stop moving. Uh, some interesting things, however, is that depending on the, on the, um, on the serotype, the cleavage sites are different. <clears throat> In particular, you can see here, uh, this is at the level of, of the sequence, and this is at the level of the structure. Again, uh, this is the, the snare complex. And you can see that there are uh, several sites uh, of interaction for, uh, for the, the different toxins, uh, going from the bond A, B, C, D, and up to, to G. Um, what happens is that 
if you consider this, this is a, a picture that is only depicted that, and, um, to show that in some of the cases, the point of cleavage are so, uh, so aggressive that actually this complex never uh, arrives to, to really uh, assemble. And in fact, if you go to see the structures of the toxins uh, in complex with the snare proteins, you see that this kind of fully uh, separate uh, um, four helix bundle cannot be formed because they really distort the structures of the proteins. And here the color codes is the same as in this case. So where, uh, while this is a full helical uh, um, conformation for a protein in the complex uh, when it's formed in, in, within the snare complex, uh, when the enzymes thrombotolism find these proteins, um, they really have to find in a different conformation. So uh, the two, conform the two uh, simultaneous interactions are not uh, possible, so they are mutually uh, exclusive. Um, so essentially what happens is that, except in the, in the case of bond A, in which the cleavage is still not so aggressive that it can allow for the formation uh, of, the, of the snare complex, all the other uh, cleavage sites inhibit the formation of the snares. Okay, so if there are, there are no snares, the vesicles cannot uh, be attached to the membrane and the neurotransmitter release will never happen, right? Um, okay, and well, and you can see that there is also, in, in some of the cases, some of these uh, toxins uh, cleave um, even to uh, snares. So in this case, for instance, bond C can cleave on a smaller peptide than bond A, but actually, since bond C also cleaves uh, syntaxin at a more aggressive point, it also results in a, in a blockage of neurotransmission. Um, so the, the question, however, is whether if bond A can leave even cleaving the protein, uh, can give place to the formation of the snare complex, uh, where there are, there are uh, different uh, outcomes of this process, and uh, eventually, why is, the, uh, is that the difference that, then, that there is in, in Bonte with, um, in, in relation with other, uh, the, with other, other serotypes? Um, because in particular, Bonte results in a much longer duration of, of the effects of, of paralysis. In all the other cases, uh, if patients uh, are uh, recovered with, um, with um, uh, artificial respiration, they will eventually uh, clean the toxins from their, uh, from their system and they will recover uh, almost completely. Uh, in the case, however, of uh, bond A, the duration of the action is much longer. And this is what allows for uh, the, uh, the use of bond A in, in cosmetics. Because when, the, when you inject uh, Botox, which is a commercial, um, the commercial uh, name of, uh, of this toxin, uh, what you do is that you put a toxin that only cleave, uh, and you do it locally, of course, not in your, not in your brain, but just in, in, your, in your muscles, uh, and you have an effect of uh, partial paralyzation of, of your muscle near your, uh, near your skin. So you're, that, that's why uh, you look younger, because actually you are not moving part of your muscle in, 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 your, in your face. Um, and there is something which is particular in the case of Bonte, and this is in particular the case that it has a much longer uh, duration. It can, I mean, if you are most, most of you are, are young people, but um, older people like uh, me or, or even older, uh, if they uh, under, underwent uh, treatments with, Bonte, uh, with Botox, uh, they know that the effect will vanish in a few months. And this is because of the clearance of, uh, of the toxin. Um, what happens, and this is something that came out uh, from, uh, from, a clever, uh, from a quite uh, smart experiment uh, in which they measure uh, the dose response of uh, different uh, bonds on the SNAP25. Um, if you take, for instance, bond E, which is, let me go back again, a toxin that cleaves snares more or less at this position uh, along SNAP25, uh, SNAP what happens is that if you measure at the same time uh, the concentration, the, the amount of protein cleaved and uh, glycine release, so that the release of neurotransmission, 
uh, as a function of the tungsten concentration, what you see is that uh, the same, uh, at the same time that a protein is cleaved, uh, the, and the release of the neurotransmitter uh, is uh, hampered in the same amount. However, if you go to see uh, to the case of bond A, you will see that which relatively smaller amounts of, uh, of, uh, pr of protein cleaved you have a big effect on the, on the release of the neurotransmission, okay? Meaning that for some reason, uh, there is a kind of perhaps cooperative effect in the interaction between snares. So in this case, one protein, uh, in the, the cleavage of one protein and correlates one to one uh, with the reduction of uh, glycine. In this case, uh, a relatively small amount of protein cleft results in a relatively high amount of uh, impairment of, uh, of um, neurotransmitter release. Uh, again, if you see that, uh, this results in an aggressive cut and this in a, in a mild cut. Um, this suggests the idea, like uh, eight years ago already, that these proteins may interact in a kind of cooperative way to form not only one single snare complex, but actually a series of cooperating complexes, which we call the uh, super snare complex, okay? So the idea is that uh, in this case, the snare complex will not form at all. And so this is clear that why uh, these uh, two lines go together. But in the case of, uh, of bond A, what happens is that you are removing just uh, uh, the capping piece of SNAP25 in this complex and you create somehow a non-functional complex. This tells you why when you cut only one protein, then it will affect an, a much larger pool of uh, proteins, and then you will cut in a few proteins, uh, modify a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sites for release of uh, neurotoxins, okay? So again, the idea is that if this happens, one possible reason or one possible explanation for that is that the, the interaction is cooperative. And if it is cooperative, it is reasonable to, um, to, to assume that it may happen through uh, interaction between uh, somehow um, nearby complexes of snare. Uh, this was just a hypothesis uh, on 205. Uh, it was much a posteriori confirmed by this very clever experiment just appeared in, in, on JAX. Uh, I just, it's not our work, but I wanted to mention it because it's, it's really, uh, really clever. What they have done is that they have two vesicles. Of course, they, they do not have one, uh, one uh, mem plasma membrane, but we, they have uh, a, um, a vesicle which is representing the real um, synaptic vesicle, and another one which contains the proteins which are located in the plasma membrane. And using fluorescent tags for each one of the proteins, they are able to monitor the formation of, uh, of uh, complexes one by one during the time. So the, 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 the conclusion is essentially the same as I just mentioned. Uh, so they observe a strong cooperative formation of multimeric snare complexes, which suggests the formation of the first, suggests that the formation of the first complex triggers a cascade of uh, uh, snare complex formation. So what we call the super snare. Uh, but this, this, this paper just appeared uh, a few, a couple of months ago or, or, or even less. Um, however, we started to, to think much earlier on that. And uh, now from the perspective of, of the modeling, uh, with the idea that if it, 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 it really happens that two snare proteins uh, can interact, so two, um, two snare complexes can interact one with the other, and uh, one should be able also to identify some interaction points, okay? Uh, and so what we did at the beginning was to start to see some conservation scores uh, with the idea that uh, there must be regions that are conserved because uh, these regions are needed for, for instance, the complexation between the snares, so regions which could be internal in the protein, and there must be other places which are not conserved because they are not used for specificity. If you do that, uh, again, remember we are uh, thinking always on SNAP25 because this experiment was performed on SNAP25 and this is because it, has, it contains two 
um, cleavage points for two different toxins. So if you do the conservation analysis on uh, SNAP25, what you find, this is uh, just any one of the many methods that you can use. Uh, residues, here what you see is the sequence number and the points uh, are related with the conservation score. Negative uh, scores means that they are very much conserved and positive scores means that they are not conserved. Um, and also keep in mind that when you do this kind of things, uh, the algorithm just uh, do alignments of sequences and assign scores in terms of the conservation, not only single conservation, but also taking into account the nature of the amino acid. So changing a valine by a leucine will still give a high conservation score, but changing an, an uh, hydrophobic by an hydrophilic amino acid will decrease uh, the, the, the score, right? So the first thing, uh, and, and this means that this kind of, uh, of approaches do not know anything about the structure. So you only work at the level of the sequences, okay? Uh, so the first, the first uh, kind of, uh, of good news came from the fact that you, you can see that there's a region here with a low conservation. And if you go to see to the, to the structure of the protein, this region here with lowest uh, conservation corresponds to this loopy region here. And this is quite reasonable because you don't need conservation in the loops because there are no structure to be conserved in that place. And uh, it's reasonable that the loops are not conserved at all. Uh, in these two regions here, you see that there is an alternancy between uh, amino acids which are conserved with uh, amino acids which are not conserved. If you go and uh, zoom into this region, you will see that there is a kind of periodicity. So there are conservation here and no conservation here. And if you count the number of points, it's about three or four. Uh, three or four is because if you remember the periodicity of an alpha helix is 3.6. And if you go to see and map this onto the structure, these residues here, which have a high conservation, usually corresponds to uh, residues which are within the helix, while these residues here, which have a, 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 low, con a low conservation, corresponds to residues which are in the outer part of the helix. So they are not needed to, for, to specific recognition, okay? Uh, this periodicity is, is broken here in particular, and we found a residue which is arginine. The number is wrong here. It should be 98. I misspelled. Um, it corresponds to arginine 98 in, uh, in SNAP 25, 20, uh, which is conserved uh, in many other species, in particular in, in Drosophila, uh, with a different number. And so uh, we started to think that if we really believe in the story of this, uh, of this interaction, we should be able to find different point of interaction. For sure, this is um, arginine uh, 98. This is correct. And now I here I mapped the conservation using a different code. Red is non-conserved, and blue is, is conserved. Uh, and again, thinking in, in this story of, of the super snare, we can identify another point of interaction uh, which is an aspartate in the other <coughs> protein which belongs to the SNERD, which is syntaxin uh, 1. And so if this is uh, true, and you put this in the context of the radial model, uh, what you would expect is that these two amino acids will form a salt bridge. And of course, if you go to mutate these two amino acids, uh, you would expect also uh, to have a some effect in the neuroxocytosis, okay? Uh, the problem is that, as I said at the beginning, um, the system is quite complicated, and you can do some experiments uh, in vitro, uh, but uh, to really have a, a, an insight of what's happening, uh, you really would go to, um, or you really should like to go to nearly physiological conditions, and the way of doing that, at least, uh, of course, I'm not, uh, I'm not an experimentalist, but for uh, the people who work in, in collaboration, uh, they, they think that the best way to do, and I agree on that, is trying to go uh, to the neuromuscular junctions. And <clears throat> this was done by introducing uh, these mutations on, uh, on uh, flies. Uh, and then to do, uh, the, once they, they got these transgenic, uh, transgenic flights, 
they went to do uh, electrophysiology on the neuromuscular junctions. Don't ask me how they do to remove the neuromuscular junction from the flies and then to do uh, electrophysiology. For me, it's, uh, it's magic. It's Aram, the guy who, who does this. Yeah, this. Uh, okay, so you know him. Uh, I really can't imagine how they do that, but uh, they do it and they do a lot of time. I mean, each of these measurements is like uh, 100, uh, 100 uh, measurements on, on different, uh, uh, n different neuro neuromuscular junctions for, from flight. And what you see, this is in the case in which you are not exciting the junction. Uh, what you see is that uh, there is a, a decrease uh, in, in the frequency in which uh, you have spontaneous release. Uh, there are two kinds of, of, of releases. One is spontaneous, so for some reason, uh, not very well clear, uh, you have a spontaneous release of, of neurotransmitters, and you can also induce that by applying a voltage. Uh, if you introduce the mutations, uh, you have a, a decrease in the frequency, but uh, if you measure uh, the frequency distribution, the distribution does not change and it corresponds to random, uh, to, to a random distribution. Meaning that of, on, although you have a decrease in, uh, a decrease in the frequency, uh, the distribution is uh, really the same. So they really are behaving as, uh, as random events, okay? Uh, another thing that is important to say is that uh, these experiments are performed in a, in a wild type environment. So uh, the wild type uh, proteins are still present in the flies. Because always, I mean, it's, well, on one side it's uh, complicated from the genetics point of view, and in some of the cases, some of the mutants are not viable. Uh, and in other, in other cases, uh, you could also expect some, um, some recariation by different isoforms of, uh, of some proteins. Um, if you do the same, the same with the, the evoked neurotransmitter release, but you see it's also a decrease in the, in the mutants, but you don't see a decrease in the rise time. So the time that it takes to arrive to the maximum, uh, uh, to the maximum of the of the of the signal in the in the current. Uh, meaning again, <coughs> uh, meaning again, that uh, somehow these mutants are affecting the neuroxocytosis. Uh, of course, uh, as a control, you can be sure and you can test by, by biochemical uh, methods that these uh, complex are uh, still functional and, uh, and they still form. And I will not show you the results because this is the, the most boring part. Uh, but in principle, the idea is that uh, effectively you can find, uh, uh, you can identify these points with points in the, in the proteins that do not alter the formation of the complex and uh, apparently are modifying the formation of the super complex. And this is because, uh, again, uh, this, these points are, are pointing to the exterior uh, of, the, of the snare. Um, so, as I said a few slides ago, uh, the system is actually a bit more complicated. And what we are trying to see is uh, try to understand how the, the entire um, the entire uh, system can can be built up during uh, the docking uh, process of this of the vesicle, uh, and in, in order to understand that, <coughs> what we have to remain also is that there are two components <coughs> in the system. One of those is, as I already said, uh, synaptotagmin. Synaptotagmin is a protein that comes attached to the synaptic vesicle. It has a, a transmembrane helix, uh, which serves as an anchor, uh, and a not structured uh, linker, and two um, C2 um, domains. So are, these are domains that bind calcium. And when they bind calcium, uh, they, are remain, they remain attached to the membrane. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, synaptotagmin is also attracted uh, to the membrane by um, PIP, so this, uh, and this are a particular kind of phospholipids which contain phosphate groups. And it's also known that there are some lysins here that uh, are uh, implied in the formation of, uh, of uh, some, some kind of complex with the snares. I said some kind of complex because actually 
uh, there have been a lot of people in literature trying to demonstrate or trying to find actually a univocous way in which this protein interacts with the snares. But actually, um, the, com the, the outcome of this, uh, of this kind of studies is that depending on the technique you use, uh, you find different kind of, of, of complex or different kinds of interaction points. You can use uh, cross linkings or, or precipitations or, or many other things, uh, mutations on, on those points. And really, the information on that case is, is confused. Um, so this protein has a, a, a function as a calcium sensor. So uh, when an action potential arrives uh, uh, to the to the action terminal, uh, then calcium comes into the into the um, into the, the the cell, and eventually this protein finds the calcium and, and is uh, anchored to the plasma membrane also. Uh, while complexin has a dual role in activation and inhibition. So at the beginning of the formation of the coupling, so during the docking, uh, with the, um, one of the, this part of this very simple protein, it's just one simple helix, uh, activates or helps in the formation of uh, the, the, um, the, docking, uh, the docking complex, while at the end of, of the docking complex, and the second part of the of complexing inhibits or, or keeps clamped uh, the, the super snare. Uh, as for complexing, there are actually two uh, X-ray structures known. Uh, I apologize for a change of course, but this is this uh, this is the original picture from from this paper here, appearing in Natural Structural Molecular Biology two years ago. Uh, what you see here is these are the two possible conformations observed for complexing. The one in pink here is uh, usually interpreted as a formation uh, which is called the post-fusion. So once uh, the, the, the snare complex is in a, fuel, uh, a fully uh, fused conformation, so when the, the neurotransmitters are released, and in this case, it's not that clear, but it's apparently related with the pre-fusion complex. Uh, as for calcium and, synapt and uh, synaptotagmin, we don't know very well, but what we do know is that if, you me if we measure uh, the calcium dependence of the neuroexocytosis uh, in our mutants, the only thing that we observe is that there is a shift uh, in the concentrations needed to activate the process, okay? So these are, uh, this is the, the, the wild type, and these are uh, the, the, the mutations. So you need a higher calcium concentration to activate uh, neuroexocytosis in the presence of, of those mutants. Uh, and here, again, I mean, this is a kind of uh, continuous game between bioinformatics modeling and, and also uh, when you do not understand the dynamics of the thing, uh, a good uh, tool for, for understanding that is to resort to molecular dynamic simulations. These are uh, a tool to follow the dynamics and also the interactions. Uh, and to do that, we are using some, we are using some <coughs> technique to, um, techniques we are developing uh, and trying to do uh, these things faster. And these techniques are particularly useful uh, in the case in which you have proteins are mem and membrane uh, involved in that because these are big systems and, and the computational time involved in this simulation is usually high. So what we have here is our version of the plasma membrane. Uh, I say this is our version because it's uh, always simplified. We only have five kind of, of phospholipids. Uh, usually in, in, a, in a cell you have in the order of 10,000 different phospholipids. Uh, in particular we have PIP2 here, which is known to be in about 5% uh, concentration in, in, uh, in the presynaptic membrane. Uh, this is synaptotagmin. This is water around and, and the rest is, is bulk water. Uh, these are the lysines here that I told you that are known uh, to interact with the snares uh, and also probably related with the, with, um, with the interaction with PAP. And what we see along the simulations is that if you start simulations without, without calcium, this is only one, we have several um, several repetitions of this, we can do, we do kind of also several trials. What you see is that, I hope you can see this, uh, these thicker phospholipids here, which are the, the PIP2s, interact with these uh, lysines there, which were 
let me start it all over again, which were completely sublimposed at the beginning of the simulation. This is something that we find, we find repeatedly. Uh, of course, the, the conformations can change, and uh, also the, um, the, the position of the phospholipids change because they move, they move and they diffuse uh, along the membrane, but this kind of interactions uh, is quite constant. Instead, if you consider the same situation here that the, the, the PIPs are in the membrane, it's just I'm not uh, putting them in, uh, in, uh, in evidence, but these are the lysines here that here are interacting with the membranes. When you put calcium there, what happens is that you have a different situation. This calcium loop remain attached to the, to the membrane mediated by the interactions between the calcium and the membrane. We actually, in some cases, lose some calcium that go deep inside into, into the membrane. Uh, but what, what changed, essentially, is that these interaction points change the conformation and change the accessibility. Okay, so apparently what calcium does is not a conformational change, or, or it, it may does a conformational change in the, in the protein, we don't know, but what seems to be that uh, the simulation suggests is that these points which are related with, uh, with the snare interactions are not accessible in one case and accessible in the other, okay? Uh, so, uh, remember, I showed you previously that, that there are two conformations for complexing, one post-fusion and one probably pre-fusion. So if we take all together and we put everything in one single model uh, and consider that there are eight components in the, in the super snare complex, what happens is that this is the X-ray conformation in the pre-fusion. Uh, you see that this, uh, this separation from, uh, from the, the main uh, snare complex ends in close contacts with the next uh, snare petal in this kind of, of rosette-like uh, arrangement. So our idea is that, and this is where we are now, we are actually, uh, we have no, uh, no uh, direct evidence or not, no evidence um, uh, from us uh, for, this, uh, for this interaction. Uh, we are still looking for, for some mutants on that. Uh, but essentially, our idea is that in the pre-fusion uh, state, the complexin clamps this, uh, this complex just because uh, there is an interaction between two consecutive snare petals uh, and not an interaction between one consecutive uh, petals. Uh, when syntaxin is in, uh, when, uh, synaptotagmid is in, uh, in the middle, it has to be located somewhere here, and this is because uh, remember that this protein in blue, which is bump, is attached to the to the synaptic vesicle, which is seen from your side of the screen. Uh, same happens with bump. It's also uh, sorry with uh, with synaptotagmin. They are both attached to the synaptic uh, vesicle while the presynaptic vesicle is on the other side of, uh, of the screen. Um, we don't know exactly which is the, 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 the nature of the, of the change that uh, happens with calcium, but according to our simulations, we propose that uh, calcium makes these parts here and here of the protein available for interactions with, uh, with snares, eventually removing this, this <coughs> blockage here and what eventually happens is that this behaves as a kind of uh, iris from a, from a camera, uh, going from the pre-fusion to the post-fusion conformation in complexity. And this explains the two conformations observed in X-ray crystallography. So you, depending on which is the conformation and which is the state, whether calcium or not calcium, then you uh, generate a, a conformational transition in the, in the complex that allow for the opening of the fusion pore. Okay? Uh, in favor of this, of this mechanism, some of the amino acids in this region here at the end terminal uh, of uh, complexing are known as uh, superclamping or underclamping. 
Uh, and this is, this is uh, um, reasonable with, uh, with our uh, ideas in, which, in the sense that when you have mutations in this part here, uh, which are not in contact with, uh, with the um, final fu uh, fusion form, then you can increase or decrease the clamping uh, capability of the protein. So when you have super clamps, you have formation of, uh, of uh, salt bridges in this region that cannot be break and broken uh, and so easily. So the complexing has, uh, has uh, a more inhibitory effect. Uh, we are still looking for, for mutants on that, and we are still working on that. We have some data also regarding uh, some interactions here in this region, but uh, this is more or less at, at the stage where, where we are. Uh, we have the, the hope that this will help in the understanding also of the functioning uh, of these uh, of these toxin, toxins, and also how this affects the assembly uh, and the conformational transitions within uh, within the, the the exocytosis. I think I will stop uh, stop here because of uh, time. Uh, of course, I'm, I would be happy to to take some questions or, or comments. And I thank you very much for for your attention. <laughs>